Great. Thank you very much, Karina. Thank you very much, Alex, and to the other organizers of this meeting. Uh, I'm very, very happy to participate. And in my 12 minutes, I have to go very fast because there's a lot I want to say. My talk is the, the microbiome is precious and antibiotics are damaging it. This is a talk that will have four parts. The first part is the theory. We know that many diseases have increased in recent de decades, such as diseases of the esophagus, juvenile diabetes, asthma, obesity, inflammatory bowel disease, autism. The list can go on and on. Uh, I want to particularly focus on uh, obesity. This is a graph of the global number of overweight and obese children under the age of five. And what you can see is that most of the overweight children in the world are in developing countries because that's where most of the children are. There are already about 50 million children under five who are overweight who are destined to become obese. So this is a huge problem all over the world. What might the microbiome have to do with this? Well, to summarize, about humans in our microbiome. Microbial cells outnumber human cells. They are highly diverse. The populations in different niches are specific. We all have similarities across everyone, yet everyone is unique. Long-term persistence of the microbes is common, and it is clear that human biology is based on the partnership between microbes and humans. So the question that I want to address today is, could change in the human microbiome be underlying the current plagues? We know that humans get many of their microbiomes from their mothers. That's how it's always been. We begin life in the womb that is sterile or mostly sterile. We're exposed to the microbes when the water breaks and we descend through the birth canal. There's skin to skin contact. The, the baby's mouth full of microbes inoculates the breast. The moms are kissing and licking babies. They're pre-masticating foods. Lots of redundant ways to transfer the microbiome from one generation to the next. This is the way it has always been in all mammals. But in modern times, moms are different. They live in a world of antiseptics. They've received antibiotics. There are antibacterials in their diet. And babies are different. They may be born by cesarean section in some parts of the world one baby out of two is born by C-section. They miss the trip through the birth canal. They're bathed extensively. They get formula, which only superficially resembles human milk. And they get lots of medications, especially antibiotics, which I'll be talking about. On this basis, over the last 20 years, I've developed the theory of the disappearing microbiota that has two major tenets. First, that changed human ecology has altered the transmission and maintenance of ancestral microbes, which affects the composition of the microbiota. And second, that the microbes, both good and bad, usually acquired early in life are especially important since they affect a developmentally critical stage. We have in enlarged this hypothesis, which is shown here, which is the step down of the microbiota by generation. Our view is that moms are, keep losing microbes and that each generation is getting is starting out life with a smaller diversity. And this we believe is what happened in the 20th and now into the 21st centuries. What's causing this? There are many causes. I wanna focus on antibiotics. A recent estimate was 73 billion antibiotic doses worldwide yearly. That's 10 antibiotic pills for every man, woman, and child on earth. In the USA, the CDC counted 842 courses per thousand population. That's five courses for every six people year after year. According to CDC data, children by the time they're two get nearly three courses of antibiotics. By the time they're 10, 10 courses of antibiotics. And pregnant women, more than half of them are getting antibiotics. And there are also antibiotic exposures from the use on the farm, but we don't even know the scale. Now in developing countries, in some cases, the situation is worse. Here's data on antibiotic use in the first two years of life among children in eight cohorts sponsored by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The x-axis uh, the the x-axis is age in the first two months years of life. The y-axis is antibiotic courses per person year. 
This blue line is the rate in the USA. You can see that six of the places, the use is higher than in the USA, including in Pakistan and Bangladesh, where the average child in the first year of life is getting more than 10 courses of antibiotics. You wonder how is that possible? But these children have parents who love them. They have a cough or a fever. They go to a, a pharmacy. The pharmacist is happy to sell them an antibiotics. So antibiotic use is tremendous everywhere. So we are concerned about the ecological effects of antibiotic exposure. And I draw it like the proverbial iceberg. The tip of the iceberg is antibiotic resistance. We know all about this, but the body of the iceberg is what antibiotics are doing to the microbiome. They're disrupting it. And I believe this has clinical consequences. The disruptions can be transient or long-term. The consequences could be developmental, situational, senescent, or generational. And the effects could be immunologic, metabolic, neoplastic, or maternal. I'll briefly mention a few of these. So part two of my talk, evidence that antibiotics have something to do with these diseases. In this last year, we published a paper with colleagues from the Mayo Clinic looking at a total of 14,000 children born in Olmsted County over a 13 year period. And we were interested in their antibiotic exposure up to the age of two, and then their health outcomes uh, uh, between the age of two and 13. There are 10,000 children exposed to antibiotics, 4,000 not exposed. Here's the major result of the study, associations between antibiotic exposures in the first two years of life and risk of 10 common health conditions. You can see these, asthma, food allergy, obesity, uh, learning disability. This is the hazard ratio, and a hazard ratio of one says that antibiotics have no effect. In fact, for all 10, the hazard ratios are greater than one, and for eight of the 10, they are statistically significant, meaning there's a significant association be, between antibiotic use in the first two years of life and development of these conditions. We also showed specific associations with the number of antibiotic courses, timing of exposure, and antibiotic class. Now I'm gonna show you evidence that antibiotics affect development, that transient effects can have long-term consequences, that effects are mediated via the microbiome, and that effects may cross generations. Our work actually began with the observation that farmers have been using antibiotics to fatten up their farm animals for the last 70 years. They use antibiotics because it works. It changes metabolism. So we've done a series of studies, but I'm gonna start with a study that Lori Cox did, where she gave mice antibiotics for, for their life or only for eight weeks or only for their four weeks or no antibiotics to see if there was an effect on their metabolism. Here we're looking at the total mass of the, white, the mice, their lean mass, their fat mass. The black line is the control group, no antibiotics. All the antibiotic groups, the mice had increased total mass, lean mass, and fat mass. So antibiotics changed their developments even as little as four weeks early in life. Now we look at the microbiome. And this is a principal coordinates analysis of the fecal community structure of the mice when they're three weeks old. At three weeks, there are basically two groups of mice, control mice, no antibiotics. All the antibiotic groups are still receiving the antibiotics. The black dots are control, the orange dots are antibiotics. There's a lot of diversity, there's a lot of overlap, but antibiotics are a little different at three weeks. Now we're gonna go to eight weeks. And at eight weeks, there are three groups, no antibiotics, continued antibiotics, or stop antibiotics. When we look at the microbial populations, black is control, Orange is continued antibiotics. They're even more distant, not surprising because they're getting antibiotics. But the group that got antibiotics and stopped, their microbiota have reverted to normal. So the antibiotic effect was transient, but the effect on the phenotype was permanent. And this was our first evidence that altering the microbiome in, the, in early life has long-term consequences. To see whether this was due to the microbiota or not, we did a transfer experiment. So mice were given antibiotics or not. We sacrificed the mice. We took their cecal contents and transferred the microbiota to germ-free mice. And these mice didn't have receive any antibiotics. We followed them for five weeks. And we asked, was there going to be a difference in their development? And here we're looking at total mass, lean mass, and fat mass. The black line is the control group. The mice that received the antibiotic perturbed microbiota put on increased total mass. No change in lean mass, increase in fat mass. 
So the altered microbiota was sufficient for the metabolic effect. We have continued these studies by looking at disease models. Here's work that Shusang Zhang did on a model of type one diabetes in NOD mice that spontaneously developed diabetes. He gave mice three courses of antibiotics or none, or even one course of antibiotics or none. Here's the Kaplan-Meier analysis of type one incidence in the male mice. The blue line are the control group. They received no antibiotics. They're developing diabetes as we expect in male nod mice. But the mice that received antibiotics, they're getting diabetes earlier and more of it. So this is an, one example of a model. We have recently been giving antibiotics to very young mice, penicillin, and looking at development of the brain. And in this paper just published in the last few months, we see that the antibiotics as expected changes the microbiome, but it also changes uh, gene uh, expression in, in critical parts of the developing brain. Final piece of evidence is uh, people in Denmark have shown that antibiotics increase risk of inflammatory bowel disease. We wanted to use a mouse model and ask, can the antibiotic altered microbiota affect IBD in the next generation? We studied IL-10 deficient mice that spontaneously developed colitis. Angel Schulfer did this work. She gave antibiotic perturbed microbiota or normal microbiota to germ-free mice that were pregnant. And now these germ-free mice were conventionalized, either conventional mice or, or IL-10 deficient mice. The mice gave birth to their babies. And now we followed the babies into to middle age. We were interested in the effects on ecology and disease. There were many effects on ecology. In this short time, I'm just gonna focus on disease. So here we're gonna look at the colonic pathology in the IL-10 mice when they're 21 weeks old, according to the microbiota to which their mother was exposed. Here's a mouse whose mother got the control microbiota. This mouse has colitis as we expect in IL-10 deficient mice. But the mouse whose mother received the antibiotic perturbed microbiota, they have a huge amount of colitis. It's 30 times more. To summarize this experiment, let me remind you that neither the pups nor their mother ever received an antibiotic. That means that the enhanced disease signal is entirely microbial. That means that the antibiotic effects can cross generations. And it also means that inheritance is not just based on, on host genes, but on microbes and their genes as well. To summarize, antibiotics have long-term effects on metabolism and immunity. The effects are due to perturbing the microbiome. Other factors of modern life also contribute. The effects may be transmitted to the next generation. We need to find and implement solutions. Part four, hope. How can we solve this? One, one is that we have to use antibiotics less. We have to be much more intentional about how antibiotics are used, but that alone won't restore things. We need to do restoration and that's where the microbiota vault will be so important. So let me show you a recent experiment just published a few months ago that Shusang Zhang did in the type one diabetes model in nod mice. In addition to mice that got uh, uh, antibiotics or control, we had a group of mice that got antibiotics and then we gave them maternal sequel microbiota back. We, we tried to restore them. And this is the Kaplan-Meier curve. The blue line is the control group. The red group is, is the group that got antibiotics. And the green group is the group that got antibiotics and then got the sequel transfer. Their, their phenotype is restored. So this is a proof of principle that we can restore after an antibiotic exposure. This is also a pathway to understanding the microbial uh, genes, the, the, the microbial taxa, genes, metabolites, and also the host uh, genes as well that are affected. So, what I've pointed to is a story that we are losing biodiversity. This is a developing country like developed country like the United States. We're seven generations into development. This might be a country like India or China. This might be a country in, in Africa that's only beginning to develop. They, they, they've retained most of their diversity. This, is, this was my view in 2016. The question is, what's the future gonna bring? Are we gonna have further decline in the microbiota? Are we gonna be able to arrest the decline? Or are people in your generation gonna be able to reverse this through restorative steps? This will all be up to you. 
Finally, in conclusion, if you want to read more about it, I wrote a book about it called Missing Microbes. It's been translated into many languages, unfortunately not Portuguese, but uh, I encourage you to read about it and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mavi. Uh, so I encourage everyone to use the Q&A channel for, for, for asking questions. And, um, and uh, so I think uh, uh, for those joining, just heard from, uh, from Martin Blazer um, on the summary of uh, what's happening right now to our uh, microbes and uh, how we can we can uh, uh, hopefully find strategies to reverse this trend that we observe uh, in urbanization settings of the loss of the human microbes and how can we benefit uh, from uh, from populations that have very high diversity and uh, uh, while uh, those populations are interested in solving problems like infectious diseases, um, how can we work together to solve these uh, uh, different diseases that occur in different parts of, of the globe and, and benefit from the diversity that ex ex still exists in, in, in many countries. Uh, uh, I don't see any, just a second, I don't see any, um, there's one question, is there any way to restore microbial uh, differences from fecal transplants um, or diet? Sorel is asking if there's a way, any way to restore microbiome different, uh, differences from fecal transplants, uh, example, diet. Yeah, so uh, thank you for that question. Uh, many investigators are trying to uh, modify the microbiome through fecal transplant. We know that it works for a particular situation that is Clostridium difficile infections. Investigators are using it to try to improve obesity, inflammatory bowel disease, diabetes, multiple sclerosis, autism, many different conditions. These are all studies in progress. Um, you, know, you know, what I'm particularly interested in is whether we can do restoration after a course of antibiotics. Maybe in the future, parents will be banking the microbes, uh, the, the, the poop of children, and after they get an antibiotic, give them back their pre-antibiotic poop, for example. Uh, that, that's just, that's one kind of example. Diet can shape the microbiome, and once we understand a person's microbiome better, we can develop specific dietary approaches, but probably one size will not fit all. And then another important question, what's your take on the hygiene hypothesis in our increasingly clean environment? Yeah, you know, I, I think the hygiene hypothesis has merit. I favor the disappearing microbiota hypothesis, the loss of our ancestral organisms, which we're seeing is happening at a rapid rate. I think if we compare, you know, which straw is, is, is bigger, I think the loss of our ancestral microbiome is, is a more important problem than, than the hygiene hypothesis and the cleaning up of the environment because the organisms that live in dogs and cats and cows, they are adapted to those animals. The organisms that live in soil are adapted to soil. They don't do well in humans. What's important are the organisms adapted for humans. Uh, uh, one last question before we move on. Uh, you talked about non-communicable diseases and how it, how will this uh, be related with communicable diseases um, we, and the antibiotic use and the microbiota? Well, I think antibiotics have been one of the great miracles of the 20th century. They have helped us in so many communicable and infectious diseases. Uh, and so as a result, doctors and healthcare practitioners are using them more and more. And what we're coming to understand is that there is cost to this use. And so that's why we have to be much more careful about how we're using it. It's not, they are not free. They're not biologically free. And my fear is that our use for them for communicable diseases has, has increased the propensity for the non-communicable diseases because of their effects on the microbiome. 